I have had so many requests to do videos on anthropological theory and anthropologists more specifically, and the day has finally come. Today we are going to be talking about the queen herself, Margaret Mead. So in today's video, I'm going to be telling you guys all about Margaret Mead's upbringing, her contributions to the anthropological community, and of course, some of her works that she is so famous for today. So I want you guys to sit back, relax, get some tea going maybe, because I have a lot to say about this woman. So let's just get into it. Now, Margaret Mead was born in 1901 on December 16th in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she died on November 15th, 1978 in New York, New York. Now, she is a very impressive woman, and this begins with her schooling. So she actually got her undergraduate degree from Barnard College, and then she went on to pursue a master's and PhD, both from Columbia University. Now, a little bit about her upbringing. She actually had five siblings growing up, and her mother and her father were both extremely involved in the academic space. They were both academics. Her father was actually a finance professor and her mother was a sociologist who primarily worked with Italian immigrants. So you can see that the influence of both her parents likely had an impact on her interest and draw towards the anthropology field. Lastly, I just want to mention that Mead actually married three times throughout her life and had one daughter. So this is a little bit of context on her family life and just her education. So now that you guys know the basics about Margaret Mead, let's jump into the anthropology side of Margaret Mead. I feel like the biggest question that's so easy to ask is why is Margaret Mead so renowned in the anthropological community? What is it that she did that really transformed not only the way that we think about anthropology, but also the way that we conduct anthropology? Now, something really interesting that I found out about Mead throughout this week of research is that she actually didn't become very well known for the work that she was doing until her 60s and her 70s. So she was making huge contributions to anthropology for most of her life, leading up to this point before she gained a lot of traction when it comes to attention from other people and also just attention from anthropologists more specifically. Now, if I did not say this already, which I don't think I did, Margaret Mead was a cultural anthropologist, and this is where she really becomes a pioneer in the field. So for anyone who may not know, anthropology actually has four main disciplines, four main subfields, and these subfields are biology, archaeology, culture, and linguistics. Now, Mead, her contributions are in the cultural side of anthropology, and so that's the part of anthropology that she really had a huge impact on. Now, something that really surprised me, actually, is that Mead was actually really close friends with some other famous anthropologists. I know this happens all the time in academia, but I forget constantly. If you guys have ever heard of Franz Boas or Ruth Benedict, these are both people that Margaret Mead not only knew, but was actually very close friends with. Franz Boas was actually her supervisor in anthropological study, and Ruth Benedict was a very close friend of hers. I think I also read somewhere that they might have been lovers, but I don't actually know that for sure. So you guys can dive into that wormhole if you're wondering. Now, I think that where Mead's work really becomes notable and really where she got a lot of attention begins with her travels to the South Seas when she actually began living with the people of Samoa and learning about their daily lives, their culture, their rituals, uh, their traditions, everything that you've probably associated with anthropology, the way that we think of anthropology today. Now, during her time as an anthropologist, she actually wrote 23 books. And her most famous work is called Coming of Age in Samoa. And I'm actually going to be talking quite a bit about that one in a little bit here. But I just want you guys to know that she had such a passion for anthropology. And I really do think that's reflected in not only the quantity of the books she was creating, but also the quality. There's so much to be gained from her work. And if you guys ever have the opportunity to read not only Coming of Age in Samoa, but some of her other pieces as well, please, please go check those out because I think you can only benefit from reading this work. A few other things about her is she was actually a longtime worker and curator at the Natural History Museum in New York. Now, for anyone who may not have heard of the Natural History Museum in New York, at least here in America, that is a very big deal. It's a very famous museum. I have always wanted to go there. I think that would be such an incredible experience. 
hopefully one day I'll go. But she is known for working there and contributing to the exhibits and the work that is being done there. And just really quickly, let's mention some of her awards because this woman is an absolute queen. She was actually elected president of the American Association of the Advancement of Science think that's it at the age of 72 years old which again the president I mean guys this is insane this is this would never happen to me in a million years and then after her passing in 1979 she was actually awarded the presidential medal of honor for her work and this is essentially one of the highest awards that you can earn in the United States I mean it, it, I, I don't even know what else to say. Like that's just incredible and amazing. And if these awards don't show you what she's capable of and how much of an impact she had on anthropology and the way that we study other people, I just, I don't know what will. Now, at the beginning of this video, I did promise you guys that I would be talking about her work and some of the things that she really did contribute to the anthropological community more specifically. And in this section, there's so much that I could talk about. So I thought the most effective thing would actually be talking about her most famous piece of work, Coming of Age in Samoa, which is what I mentioned earlier. And she actually wrote this in 1928. Now, Mead is known for transforming the way that we think about human cultures. and. I think this book is actually the pinnacle of that. And when putting coming of age in Samoa in the context of the things that people were learning about and talking about at this time, I really do think it embodies this transformation and this open-mindedness when it comes to understanding people and human cultures. But enough of my opinion, what is this actually about? Now, coming of age in Samoa is essentially this exploration and evaluation of the youth, the adolescents living in Samoa, and it has an extreme focus on the adolescent girls and also this overall concept of sexual development in Samoa. Now, Mead more specifically focused on sexual development, right? That was a huge piece of coming of age in Samoa. However, I really quickly want to throw in here that her supervisor, uh, when she was getting her PhD, Franz Boas, who is another famous anthropologist, let me know if you guys want another video on him, he is really well known for his contribution to anthropology that explains how cultural evolution, human development is not necessarily a linear process. So people for a very long time, and you will still see this today, assume that Western industrialized parts of the world are the most evolved or the most developed or whatever it is and this point is actually what cultures are working towards right and innately that assumption that way to think about people and the world puts other cultures and other peoples below one another there becomes this like subliminal hierarchy messaging that's happening there and Boaz is saying, no, 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 it's not a solid line where we're working towards West, the Western industrialized society. That's not true. Different cultures are actually on different paths, right? And the outcomes are all different. Different things serve different cultures and there's not one way to be working. There's not one thing to be working towards. And so these ideas of Boaz, I really do think actually impacted Mead and her takeaways from her time in Samoa, especially when looking at sexual development and how these people are raised and how it impacts the way that we think about sexual development in this region. Now that was a little bit of an aside, but I do think it is helpful when understanding who Mead is and how she was thinking about these people and the way that they treat one another and all that good stuff. So circling back to Mead and her time in Samoa when she was living there you guys can look up pictures online actually it's really great and awesome to see she really became a part of the Samoan culture this is definitely reminiscent of Molinowski and his travels to the Trobriand Islands and so she lived in Samoa and essentially became a part of this community there's images of her carrying children on her back there's images of her participating in cultural traditions and she learned the language I mean she really 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 did become a part of this group of people for a long time now obviously living in a part of the world and learning the language that isn't everything you're always gonna have these innate biases from where you do come from but I do really think it's the closest step the biggest step that you can take towards understanding new communities and her willingness to learn about these people and being so open-minded and to care about these people I just think she did it so well and you should definitely check out those pictures of her online if you can I'll link some below now coming of age in Samoa I do think also got a lot of attention 
because of its focus on sexual attitudes. Now, sexual development, at least in the United States and many other parts of the world, is actually considered a very taboo topic. To some of you watching, this might make sense. This you might be like, oh my gosh, why is she talking about this? But to other people watching these videos in other parts of the world, I love how many countries these videos reach. It just makes me smile. That might not be your experience at all. Maybe sexual development and growth is actually a very regular part of your culture. And so Mead traveling to a different part of the world that's different from the United States the East Coast where she's from, she really got to see that there wasn't this taboo connotation when it came to sexual development and sexual attitudes in Samoa. People were really open about their sexuality. Children knew exactly what sex was at a very young age. And Margaret Mead noticed that since sexual attitudes are so scandalized in other parts of the world, and essentially the opposite of that in this part of the world, she was wondering how that impacted, and the mental health wasn't really the term at the time, but the development, the mental development, the growth, the mindset of these children in Samoa. And she ultimately argued that these attitudes towards sex and sexual development in Samoa actually contributed to lower stress in girls and women. And essentially you can kind of see here that there's not these societal expectations about sex, about who you need to be dating, when you need to get engaged, when you need to get married, who you are and who you are not allowed to date. All these questions that maybe people have, at least in the United States, I can say that for sure. And something that I really do wanna throw in here is that her work on sexual attitudes in Samoa actually contributed a lot, I think, to the sexual revolution in the 1960s that happened in the United States. These attitudes about who you are with and when and why really did take a huge shift in the 1960s and the 1970s in the United States. And her work, Coming of Age in Samoa, I think had a huge impact on this. And yes, if you wanna learn more about this work, please go read it or read some of her other pieces. They're great. So yes, you heard it from here first, folks. Now, as I'm not talking about some of her other work because I don't want to spend too long on this video, I don't want to bore you, I really did want to throw in here that she eventually went on to work about gender roles in the United States. Now, unfortunately, World War II was something that was happening at the time of her work, and so this prohibited her from traveling back to some parts of the world that maybe she wanted to explore further. So she essentially turned her attention to gender roles in the United States, and so if you're interested on learning about her work on this, I will have some links for you in the description box down below. Now this is actually all I have collected about Margaret Mead. Now this video was a lot longer and I apologize for that. I hope you guys are able to sit back, relax, maybe have a cup of tea, enjoy a little story about this amazing person who is probably the most famous anthropologist to ever exist. So let me know which anthropologists you want to hear about in the future. These definitely take me a lot longer. I like to do a very comprehensive literature review for each of these anthropologists because I don't, I just think it's really important to know your stuff. So let me know who you want to see and I will try to get that video out to you guys as soon as possible. I hope you guys are having a wonderful December. Um, and yeah, I will see you all next Sunday. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And yes, all right, that's it, you guys. <laughs> Bye.